All right, no time like the present. So good afternoon and uh, welcome to another and the final session of uh, New Ventures uh, Entrepreneurs Bootcamp, uh, the educational series where we're offering you insight into what to expect in terms of the nitty gritty details of managing and starting your own business. This is the final uh, in a series of sessions uh, that we've had throughout the spring um, to help you familiarize you with uh, the services and resources that are available through uh, Startup in a Box. Today, we're being joined uh, by Austin Weiss, the uh, Relationship Manager for City National Bank, and he's going to be talking about uh, Treasury Management or Business Banking 101. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Austin to tell you a little bit about himself and uh, what uh, banking has to offer. Thank you, Matthew. Let me go into the presentation. While you're pulling that up, I should remind uh, the folks who've been with us uh, throughout the spring and folks who are joining us for the first time, there's a Q&A function available at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if any questions arise throughout the, uh, the presentation, feel free to just enter them into the Q&A. There's an anonymous function if you'd like to use it that way. Um, and we'll be reserving some time at the end of the, uh, the session for questions if you have them. With that, now I'll hand it over to you, Austin. Thanks, Matthew. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yep. Great. All right, yeah. Uh, thanks everyone for, for uh, letting me be here. Really excited about the opportunity to share some of my story and experience of being a founder and then joining the city national team and, and sort of the um, financial literacy that I've gained um, in the time that I've been here. So I'm a relationship manager at City National Bank, been working there for four years. Um, a relationship manager really is the point person at a bank. They're your main, um, main point of contact uh, and they manage the entire relationship so that they find the solutions in the bank for you so that you don't have to find it yourself. Um, they really work as a consultant. You kind of present them a problem and then uh, we can work through creative solutions through our different uh, banking products to, to find what is the best solution for you. That's uh, really what my job responsibility is now. But before that, I, uh, I founded a, a company called Park Genius, which later turned into Park X. Um, it was a payment platform that lets you pay for parking through your phone, parking garages, all that stuff. Um, and I did that for six years and sold it that company in 2018. So I feel like I have been in the founder shoes and then part of my experience uh, with that exit led me to want to join the bank and uh, kind of improve my financial skills. And, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So I know it says uh, a relationship with CMB there, but I'm gonna try to keep it as, as uh, non-sales pitchy as possible. So uh, we're gonna start with my story. Here's the agenda. Then we'll kind of go into what a company should be looking at before they get approach a bank, um, things that, that you need to set up on your own to make sure that you have the smoothest um, smoothest relationship with the bank. Then approaching the bank, what to look for in a bank, what makes a bank a good fit for each individual company and sort of the, the stages in the life cycle. Um, and then once you're in a bank, building the relationship with the bank and kind of the life cycle of a company as they work through growing and scaling. And then the stages of funding for a company, but how that relates to the opportunities that come from a bank. Um, some companies that are, you know, pre-seed are gonna have different opportunities that are, that are companies that are gonna be in their series C. And we'll move on to specialty uh, services and products. These are things that I had no idea that banks offered before I started working here. Um, and I think that could be valuable at least to plant that seed in your head. So you know that that's an opportunity down the line or, or currently. And then we'll get into a little bit of City Nationals and I'll get into my sales pitch why I think City Nationals is the best. And then we'll go over a couple success stories. So my story, as I said, I founded uh, Park Genius in uh, 2012 uh, at the University of Arizona. I was a, a marketing and entrepreneurship major. Uh, I have written down here to make a little UCLA joke, but I can't think of anyone right now. Um, but it started off as a capstone class. You know, it's a really cool project where we spent 
one entire year uh, building a team, coming up with a concept, and then implementing that into a real life solution. Uh, the last day of our, our class, our graduation day, we presented to investors and, and ended up getting uh, $50,000 in funding, you can see in the second bullet. Um, our main competition at that time when we launched Park X, Park Genius, was uh, Park Mobile and Passport Parking. Park Mobile was doing the same solution as us, but only in Europe. And then Passport Parking was the first company that launched in the United States doing a similar concept, and, and they launched with $8 million in funding. So we were at a significant disadvantage from the beginning, but we competed by focusing on small markets. We were going after city contracts in you know, Tucson, Arizona, El Paso, Corpus Christi, Texas, whereas our competitors were going after uh, you know, New York City, Dallas, um, Los Angeles. And so as we progressed in our, our life cycle, we started executing on our contracts better. We started getting more opportunities and eventually we won the third largest parking contract in the country, which was uh, Austin, Texas. Um, that was a huge win for us, but the problem was because we were still so lean that we needed about 500 to $750,000 in funding in order to service that contract. There was a lot of upfront needs as well as we significantly undercut our competition in order to win that contract. And we needed some upfront uh, cash so that we could manage those losses in the beginning to reap the uh, return on investment in the further out years of the contract. So as we got this contract, we kind of were in a tough place where at that time, our company was only really valued at about a million, a million and a half. So to give up that much equity in the company was really a hard decision um you know at that point it would have been a majority of the company and we would have to lose our 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 majority rights so i wanted to to move forward with the contract but my two other founders did not so we ended up selling uh the the company and the contract to our largest competitor passport in 2018 and really they just wanted to buy us for our contracts um, and to me, it was a mistake and I'll get into kind of why that was a mistake, um, on the next slide. So, um, I joined the bank with basically zero, um, financial experience. And that was to bolster those financial literacy that I didn't have during my time as uh, a founder of Park X, Park Genius. Um, I, like I said, I was a marketing and entrepreneurship major, so I didn't really understand much about the bank. And instead of going back to school, my thought was, why don't I, I get a job at the bank and have them pay me for an education in this financial uh, literacy world? So that was my plan. I, I started out at the bank and really had to sell them on why they should hire a, uh, a person with no financial uh, major or background. But that's what the role of a relationship manager is, is to have those people skills, the ability to uh, translate the financial concepts of the bank to the layman's person, and also think holistically from the founder's perspective and say, okay, this is what you're kind of looking for in the bank, and these are the, the products that are, that are gonna help you. So once I made that sales pitch, you know, they, they had me on and I've, I've been here ever since. Um, and now I feel like I'm a, a really, truly uh, astounded by all the different opportunities that startups have from a bank. Um, and, you know, one of the biggest things I learned was that, you know, you don't really need to have a rich old guy all the time to give you money. You know, there's a lot, lots of different ways to, to finance your business from a bank. For example, in my situation, we could have came to the bank with that purchase order from the from the city of Austin, Texas, and gotten a, a contract or a loan based on that contract. It's a very secure uh, a, a vendor, so that the bank would be would know that we were going to get paid back through the city of Austin, and we could have got you know probably a million million and a half dollar loan and could have kept all of the equity in the company. And that's something that you know looking back on it was a huge 
that I made and one that I want to impart onto other founders is that when you think you don't have a lot of options, it's a great time to approach a bank and see what really options they have, there, there are. Um, you know, we could have done receivables financing where, you know, we get paid on the accounts receivable that we have out. That's something that the bank does a lot for smaller companies that maybe are working with the Amazons or the Googles that are out there that are very reliable that they're going to pay, but the payment terms are bad for the company. You know, maybe you're getting paid in 120 days, but you have to supply the whole order up front. That's where we can do a receivables financing where we'll up, you know, give you a portion of the accounts receivable that you have up front. And that really helps the cash flow of the business. Um, so the first slide here, our first point here, you know, develop a, a relationship with your bank or banker, use them as a financial consultant, let them be the experts. The, when I was the founder of the business, I was worried about getting the next contract and making sure that we had enough money to, to make payroll. Um, I really wasn't worried about exactly how we could get a loan and, and how we could leverage our assets. Let the banker do that for you. And the earlier you can bring them in, the better. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But the banker is there to, to really supplement you and be that financial consultant. Uh, the, the second bullet, cash flow management, that is the most important thing I see for, for startups, for small pre-seed and seed companies, is that they are not managing their cash flows effectively. Um, you know, you want to avoid credit cards if at all possible, although sometimes credit cards can be uh, beneficial in a very unique, uh, very unique set of circumstances. But um, you know, there's a lot of different things that come with that cash flow management and, and developing a platform through a bank. Um, you get fraud protection, you get positive pay, which is a great feature um, that all banks have. It basically allows you to set the amount that a vendor is going to charge you. And if they charge you anything different or if it's off by one cent, the payment doesn't go through. So that avoids fraud. Um, and having that cash flow management puts some security protocols in place that you wouldn't necessarily have um, if you weren't using a treasury management or cash flow management platform. For example, we had a recent case about a month and a half ago where a CFO of a company had her email hacked. That uh, hacker went in and sent an email to the bank to make a wire transfer for a couple million dollars out of the account to that hacker's personal account. Because of that relationship with the relationship manager, the relationship manager called the CFO and, you know, double check that, that they were making this payment, the hacker had already gone in and updated all the profile information to reflect their own information so that a call would have went to him had they called directly from the portal. Um, but because the relationship manager was there and had the, the previous cell phone number, called the CFO, found out that it was fraud and stopped that payment. So these, that's kind of the benefit of having these cash flow management and then also having a relationship manager on your team is it's, it's much easier to prevent fraud upfront than, than trying to get your money back after it's already happened. Um, the last bullet here is specialty banking products. Um, these are basically things that I had no idea the bank even offered when I, when I first joined here. It opened a whole new world of banking products to me. I mean, we've already talked about the accounts receivable and, and payables financing, but in terms of purchase order financing, I mean, I was working with a company that makes uh, armored vehicles for um, different countries around the world, uh, specifically for their governments or high net worth individuals. Uh, they have, you know, these vehicles are upwards of $250,000 to $500,000 per per vehicle. And so when they have a contract, you know, to provide 10 vehicles, they really don't have the cash on hand to, to uh, fill those orders. But when you have a contract from, you know, the UAE saying that they're going to pay you, that's good enough for the bank and that we can uh, upfront that money so that you can produce that for, for your, your customers. And then the last one is a really cool 
um, concept for more subscription-based uh, companies, foreign exchange and international trade. Um, we have a lot of companies that have suppliers or buyers that are um, out of the country, specifically in Asian markets. Um, for those, sometimes it's beneficial to set up a account in that foreign exchange currency so that you're not having to pay the conversion rate every time you pay. One, it's going to be a lot more beneficial to your, to your uh, supplier if they're having to convert that money into their own currency at the end. Or um, there's also a way to um, you know, hold that money in different currencies at different interest rates, depending on how strong or, or how valuable it is. And there's experts at the bank who do this 24 seven and they look and analyze your business and see exactly how many payments are going out in these different currencies. They look at the conversion rate and see if it makes sense for you to, to set something up. And you know, I saw one of my, my customers was making you know, hundreds of thousands of payments in foreign currencies. And just by setting up a foreign currency account, they were able to save about four or five percent every year when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, that that turns into a significant portion and, and really nothing changed from their operation standpoint other than having two bank accounts now, one in a foreign currency and one in US dollars. Um, moving on, kind of getting into uh, before banking, things that you guys should think about while you're setting up your company. Um, hire a CPA and an outsourced CPA is preferred. And an outsourced CPA usually can go for about $8,000 to $12,000 per year. So it's not crazy expensive. But the reason why outsource is preferred is because usually those CPAs have a lot higher knowledge of one, banks and different um, funding sources. They may know different um, private equity people or venture capitalists, but also with different relationship with banks where you can get a preferred look. And secondly, outsourcing a CPA is helpful if you're looking for an industry specific CPA. You know, not all CPAs are created equally. When I started ParkX, our first CPA was doing a lot of lawn care um, and forestry work and really had no idea how to manage a capital gains merger and acquisition um, exit. And so that was something that we, you know, at the 11th hour had to find a new CPA when we're trying to close a deal and it was just a headache. So having somebody who is set up in your industry from the beginning, who knows kind of the life cycle of your company and what to expect is gonna be huge. Um, obviously, gap accounting is key. That's generally accepted accounting principles. That's more for any non-U.S. citizens or, uh, who may be uh, on the presentation today. Um, some foreign countries don't use gap accounting. So um, that's just what everyone in the United States and, and basically around the world uh, uh, uses. Uh, second bullet point there is separate, separate business and personal spending. This is something I see a lot with the seed and pre-seed companies is that a lot of founders are running their personal expenses through the company and that's totally fine. I mean, I did it too. I see a lot of people doing it. It's not uncommon, but when you approach a bank, it's going to be a lot harder for the bank to understand the health of your business if the founder is pulling out $20,000 here and there for personal expenses. You, got, you have to remember that the bank does not lend on top line revenue, that we're lending on net income. So what is the profit that the business is making? And so you can still have those expenses, but you can um, have them come out of the business in the form of a distribution, which comes out at the bottom of, at the end of net income. And so that would allow the EBITDA number to be much higher and you know, have the strength of your business look a lot better as you approach that bank um, and, get, and get a higher uh, return and a lower rate. So, I mean, for an example, I was looking at two very similar companies in the restaurant space and they're both doing 10 million in revenue, but one was doing 1 million in profit and the other one was doing 2.5 million in profit. We ended up not even lending to the 1 million in profit because we couldn't figure out who, where the money was going where it was being spent and 
how much of that was legitimate business expenses from the from the uh, owner and it turned it out that it wasn't worth our time to uh, try to figure out this owner expenses so having that CPA will go through the the second bullet and, and be able to pull that out for you and then the last one is you know approaching a bank when you're strong is very key don't approach a bank when you're desperate obviously that's easy to say before uh, you're in the, the situation but um, having foresight and knowing that okay maybe I got around right now but that money is going to eventually dry out in you know what is my runway it's going to run out in, in 12 months but when you get that financing, your cash position is very strong. The business looks strong. You can come to a bank and get much better rates and terms than you would have had you approached later on in the life cycle. So, and basically the position of the business is the same. The only difference is you just got a round of, of financing. Um, there is possibilities when you get those financing for cash secured loans, which um, do have some benefits. Basically, what that means is is that the secondary source of repayment for the loan, if the business failed, would be the cash of the business. So you would get a, a round of investment, you know, a million dollars invested, and then you could get a cash secured loan on that million dollars that you just got. You could get an additional five hundred thousand on top of it. Yes, that five hundred thousand in cash is is locked for a time being, but it makes your position. Um, you know, 50% higher in terms of cash, because as you make those payments, the cash comes off. The benefits are, you know, you get to build your credit. And then there's the possibility of getting a much, much lower interest rate on a cash secured loan, almost to the point where your savings on that cash that's deposited at the bank offset completely that interest rate. So you're kind of getting that free money. And as you pay it back, you're starting to get that original funding that you got from the VC or, or uh, private equity firm back. Um, and then you have that one and a half times whatever you had. And on cash secured loan, they, they can easily go up to 90% of what that is. So it's something to think about um, when you are going out for financing, uh, financing rounds, series A, series B, pre-seed, is to begin that relationship with a bank and let them know that this is what you're thinking about. And when you do secure that loan, come back to the bank and, and work on a roadmap for your for um, the different products that you would like as you grow. So approaching a bank and some of the best practices here. So minimum of one year financial statements, that's something that you know every bank is gonna have to have. Um, I know that a lot of companies are seed or pre-seed and most of their financials, you know, have two or three line items in it at most. But even if it's just two or three line items, that's better than nothing. And the earlier you start tracking your financial expenses and put them into a template, an income statement and a balance sheet cash flow statement, that is going to be huge when approaching a bank. I mean, we want two years, but we need minimum of one year. So the earlier you start on there, it starts the clock so that you can apply for the bank once you have that one year of financial statements. Um, we're also going to need business and personal tax returns. We need those personal tax returns because we're more lending to the, the person than the business in some of these um, you know, seed companies in Series A. And so we need to check if there's any felonies, if there's any lawsuits outstanding, and then also for that secondary source of repayment that we talked about would be the personal guarantee from the individual. So something to think about is also have your personal um, tax returns in order, your personal financial statements um, when you approach the bank. And then third is the gap accounting, which we already talked about. Um, three months of current banking statements. This can be either your personal bank, um, if you're mixing personal and business, or whatever bank you're currently working at or using. Um, this is just more so for the relationship manager, because we will look at your three months of statements and see what your transactions are to get a picture of what type of company is this, what type of products and solutions 
that we have might fit for this company. You know, if you're making a lot of payments to Asia, then maybe that foreign exchange account is something we think about. And that all comes, that proposal comes from the analysis of those three months of current banking statements. Uh, if you don't have that and you don't even have a relationship with a bank, that's totally fine. Um, that's just a preferred uh, is those three months. What you would do in that circumstance is sit down with your banker and go over what you think three months would look like. You know, what would be our payments? Are we paying through PayPal? Do we have a different vendor? Um, who do we need to set up? What are our biggest expenses? How far do we think our biggest hole is going to be? And that will help the relationship manager understand and assess the uh, opportunities that your business has at the specific bank. Um, again, the CPA should be involved up front. My most successful clients have their CPA um, CC'd on, on every email that they send me. And when they send their CPA an email, they CC me on it as well, even if it really has nothing to do with me. And that just keeps me informed on you know, what is happening with this company so that I can anticipate their needs and start, it, start thinking creatively about solutions they, they may need in the future. And that's the benefit of having that relationship manager is that I can project and think about your business from a, just a strictly financial position and your future growth while you're working on the operations of the business. And that brings me to, you know, find a bank that offers you a dedicated banker and relationship manager. This is not every bank. Um, most big banks, you know, the Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, you're not really getting any preferential treatment until you're in the hundreds of millions of dollars in, in revenue. And so, I would strongly, strongly recommend that you guys look at boutique banks as your first bank. These are uh, localized banks that focus on the ecosystem of their location. And that is where you're gonna get the most tailored service to your needs. You're gonna have the um, highest knowledge of the people in the bank there from these boutique banks and ones that I would recommend for seed and startup companies would be Silicon Valley Bank and Comerica. Those are very, very great um, banks um, for startup and seed companies. They, that is their focus. They just want to help these companies scale from you know, a company that's making one to 5 million into 25 to 50. That's their, their role. And that's kind of their bread and butter. However, those kind of companies, those two, those two um, firms, they kind of lack the upside. But at the beginning, I think it's a great opportunity to choose those boutique banks. Um, if you are at some of those boutique banks and they don't offer you a relationship manager, or you're at a chase and they, they don't offer you a relationship manager, you know, don't don't hesitate asking, saying, who is my relationship manager? And if I don't have one now, who would be my relationship manager if I make those thresholds to meet those requirements of whatever banking has? You know, you have to have X number in, in profit before we dedicate a full relationship manager for you. Well, that's okay. I just need to know who that person is so that I can start working with them up front and we can lay out a plan so that I can meet those goals. Um, building a relationship with your bank, um, you know, most companies are initially not credit worthy when they come in. You know, when I work with these seed and pre-seed companies, we are not giving them loans most of the time. What we're there to do is try to limit expenses, usually first, before trying to help um, raise the funds. So that is, I think that the biggest thing that banks can offer smaller companies is working to manage their expenses because as it says, most companies are not credit worthy at the beginning. So like I said in the last slide, develop that roadmap with your relationship manager. Though you're not credit worthy right now, what steps would it take to be credit worthy? And if you lay that out with your relationship manager ahead of time, now you have specific goals that you can uh, much easier hurdle to clear once you have those conversations down the road. 
you know, some typical things that we set up is, are, is, you know, you have to have, you know, an X number in EBITDA before we would get, give you a, a, a term loan. But if you did, this is how much you would get. And we kind of have that laid out before. I talked about the including the RM and messages with CPAs. And then uh, the last bullet, it's okay to resent problems to RMs. That's one thing that I hammer home with my clients is that, you know, a lot of them come to me thinking that they know exactly what they want already. And they've done all the research online and they've spent time, you know, figuring out exactly the difference between a term loan and a revolver and seven years versus five years and the 25 amortization versus 30 amortization. And that's time not well spent, in my opinion, because we have guys who are paid to do that, who work at the bank, who just sit there all day. And so... I prefer it and we have much better results when the founders come to the bank with a problem and say, hey, you know, I need, this is what the, the company is trying to do. We're trying to buy a second location and we're not sure how to do it. We're, we're growing rapidly and we need to get a second location. So then we can look at, okay, what is the best way to finance this purchase? Do we want to do it with a straight loan? Do we want to add some, um, you know, different conditions to get there? What is going to give you the best interest rate? How much should you put down up front? Um, all these things, and, and how does that relate to the cash health of the business? You know, if you put too much up front on that second uh, second location, will that drain the cash from the business, and then both locations fail? These are things that a consultant at the bank has seen before, the relationship manager has seen everything before. We've seen businesses try to do all types of transactions. So um, I'm, I feel very safe saying that any problem that you present, we have several clients that have had that same problem and we can present you know, um, success stories and failures to help you make that decision. And that's one thing that we like doing too is, is presenting multiple options letting the founder choose instead of just going down one path. So the stages of funding and you know how that kind of relates to a banking relationship. So pre-seed and seed, I just kind of you know picked arbitrary numbers there. You know, 100,000 to a million in funding is basically what I picked. And that acronym PBB that stands for personal and business banking. The, they have segmentations at the bank based on your company's size. And so the smallest size at most banks is called PBB, personal and business banking. And what you can typically uh, are offered through uh, PBB is treasury management um, services. That includes checking accounts, uh, ACH payments, which is payments payroll, um, wires, and then other types of, of payments, maybe offshore or um, uh, secondary currency payments. So I have a little video here that talks about exactly what you can see from a treasury management perspective and kind of walks you through, um, you know, what City National's platform looks like. So I want to make sure that you guys can see this. Matthew, are you, are you able to see the, uh, the video? If you're there, I don't, I don't, I don't see a video. Okay, then I'm going to try to share it now. Okay, how about now? I still just see your. Uh, oh wait, your I haven't hit share. I haven't hit share yet. Sorry. So I can see the page with it on. Have you started? Okay. Playing? No, haven't played it yet. Here we go.
So Austin, I hate to interrupt, but uh, yeah. if there's supposed to be sound coming through. Uh, oh, there's no it, sound? So if you could just help with the voiceover. That'd be great. <laughs> okay. Um, can, you, can you hear me though? Oh, I can hear you great. That's just- oh, that's, uh, that's terrible. Okay. Uh, yeah, basically going through the uh, different pages here, um, you know, all the different ways that you can customize the transaction list. Um, I mean, everything's kind of self-explanatory here. Bummer that you guys can't hear the audio, but I just wanted you guys to be able to see what the platform looks like so that you know it's, it's very similar to what a personal banking platform would look like. But there are different, um, you know, services that are tailored for the business with the fraud control, um, the wire payments, and then, um, you know, you can even link this to your personal account if you, if you want to have that. And I've had several clients do that where maybe they want to um, leverage the business's success for some personal gains and they can link the business's account to the owner's account. And then that sets them into a different, you know, category where now they get a black card and they get you know, access to different suites and first class and blah, 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 blah. And those are different options that are all available through the project manager. Um, but if we can't hear the audio, then let's get back to the presentation. Let's see, new share. Um, let's go back. Okay. So uh, that was a little bit of treasury management. Um, again, that is just sort of a standard banking platform that allows you to customize all the different uh, cash management issues that a bank has or that a, that a company has. Um, it's really important that you get set up on that as soon as possible and that you know the system well. Most banks offer uh, training services where they can have somebody physically come to your location or they can do virtual now or they'll give you a dedicated one hour training. Um, I would recommend everybody taking that training even though it seems very intuitive. There are unique features that um, the best companies in my portfolio seem to, to know about and the ones that are the middle don't. Um, I'm talking about the, and in the bullet there, the debit and credit cards. I had mentioned earlier about being wary of, of credit cards and debit cards, um, but there are some circumstances where uh, they could be very beneficial. And one of those, I mean, for my, for my example, my company, it could have been very beneficial. I mean, we could have taken a, a credit line for probably 500,000, put it all on the credit card and then paid that off in time and, and kept that 50% of the equity that we were, that we were gonna have to give up. And that would have been a way to keep the business and still service the contract. Uh, obviously we had to pay a high rate on that, but it, it, would, have, uh, it would have paid dividends on the exit, that's for sure. Um, another example of those debit and credit cards is a client I have who owns several fast food restaurants. And the, he was making uh, probably about a million dollars in expense payments that he was doing either through PayPal or writing with a check. And we switched that million dollars in payment to a credit card, which he would pay off you know, immediately. And because he was making so many payments through the card, it leveled him up into the highest you know, stratosphere that we have. And he was able to get $50,000 back on that million dollars, which he then um, reinvested into local marketing because he was part of a, a franchise. There's a percentage that goes to the national um, advertising. And that is, you know, 90% of your budget goes to the national advertising. And then you have a small amount. He was saying maybe five to $10,000 per year on the local advertising. And so he was able to add $50,000 to that local advertising budget, you know, and taking it from a 10,000 to 60,000. And over the course of a year and a half, he went from being a middle of the road operator 
to having, uh, you know, in the top 10 percentile of most profitable uh, franchisors in the country. And that was simply from moving expenses that he was paying through check to expenses to paying for credit card. That made sense because he had the ability to pay back the credit card immediately and didn't have to incur that interest rate. So that's why I say you have to be careful with credit cards, but in some circumstances, it is very beneficial. And that's where the RM can come in and say, you know, this is one of those unique cases where I think we should explore this option. Um, series A, we did uh, one to five million is what I said, you know, a typical investment size could be. Again, you're in this uh, personal and business banking. That ABL stands for asset-based lending. This is typically what we're going to do before uh, companies come to commercial banking and are a little bit more credit worthy. Uh, we talked about the cash secured uh, credit and the benefits of that. And then the accounts receivable, payable financing. You know, we talked about that already, but that's a huge, huge thing for uh, clients as they look to scale, you know, specifically customers working with AAA rated businesses. You know, you're working with a Walmart or you're working with a Google or an Amazon. The payment terms are very uh, negative towards the, towards the supplier. And so uh, some companies go out of business by accepting those contracts because they can't service them. So having those accounts receivable and payable financing can be a, a key way to keep the cash flow of the business healthy while you're uh, finishing on, on your orders. And then inventory factoring, that's if you have, you know, a high asset business where you're making a lot of products that you're going to sell. You know, a lot of your cash could be tied up in that inventory while it sits, you know, on the shelf. There's a uh, ability to lend against that inventory, um, depending on how valuable it is. Um, or, or what the repurpose of that inventory is. Typically, you'll see maximum maybe 50%. But if you have a, you know, a lot of money in inventory, you got $5 million in inventory, you know, it could be a, a good opportunity. And then lastly, Series B and, and up, uh, you're looking at personal uh, and business banking. Their threshold is usually around 20 million. And then commercial banking comes in for clients that are, that are higher than that. And that's when you're gonna see your more traditional term loans where you're getting a you know, seven year term on a 25% amortization. Um, you know, typical rates I'm seeing right now are 3.3 are to 3.5% on that money. Um, revolvers are an interesting product that, that some people might not know about. It's basically a, um, a Play, play as you pay type of term loan. You don't get funded 100% up, up front. You know, if you have a $3 million term loan, when it's accepted, you get $3 million. Whereas a revolver, it's, you can draw on it at any time. So you could say, I have a million dollar revolver and there's nothing extended on it. You're not paying any interest or principal back on it, but it's already there and it's already approved. So if anything happens where it's a rainy day or, or something terrible happens to the business and you need that money, you can draw on it without having to go in the credit process. And um, you can take money out and pay it back whenever you want. And so that it's kind of like having a secondary pocket where you can draw on it when you need it. And I see a lot of the bigger businesses have that um, where you kind of keep it for a rainy day. I, I had one of our largest clients had a uh, $50 million revolver and uh, they drew on it about two weeks before the pandemic hit and they completely maxed it out. So they were able to get $50 million of, of cash right before the pandemic hit and they didn't need to do any underwriting or go through any credit approval process. It was already done and that definitely saved the business. From going under and now that they're back healthy again they're making payments back and it's only half drawn and eventually probably in the next year and a half it will be you know back to zero and they'll still have that opportunity to pull on it whenever these are a little bit more um involved financial products but as you're in that series b you get opportunities to to more tailored solutions and then uh the money market accounts these are for um Clients that have a lot of, of cash on hand, 
um, and they don't necessarily need to hold or, or save that money for cash flow purposes of the business. Instead of leaving it just in your regular checking account, they have money market accounts where you can earn you know, up to 2% on that money. Um, that money does have to be hold, held in that account for a certain number of days, but if you weren't planning on touching it anyway, that's a lot better than the you know, 0.06 savings rate that I'm seeing right now currently in the industry. Um, some of the negatives with that is you have limited transfers. I think you can only do two or three transfers from it. But um, again, that's a specific product that I see a lot of our companies in that Series B segment uh, start asking the bank to look at. Um, some specialty services and products. These are our products that you're going to maybe want to consider throughout the life cycle of the bank. Um, private banking, that is for uh, clients who are high net worth. You know, maybe the business is becoming very successful and the founders, you know, now find themselves in a different bracket. That's when you want to approach private banking where they're going to help you set up trusts. Um, you know, uh, also help you with, you know, high net worth um, purchases of housing. Uh, they do uh, airplane buying, yacht buying, all that type of stuff for the super high net worth individuals. And it's nice to have that as part of the bank, because if you're kind of starting at those boutique banks, as you move, their, their services don't necessarily grow with you. So um, it's nice at specialty or at City National, we have that private banking in where you can start in PVB, you can work to commercial banking and eventually find yourself in private banking. Um, international trade, uh, that's a key piece that we have, you know, a lot of suppliers and customers work with Mexico and Europe. Um, understanding the different laws around import export and uh, duty as well as the different laws of those countries is very important. We have you know, three or four people who are dedicated international trade people. They've been doing it for 40 or 50 years. One of the, our, our um, product partners there speaks every year at the, uh, um, the convent in Washington, DC. So he's kind of one of our superstars. A lot of people know about that guy. Um, foreign exchange, we talked about 401k is something to think about. There is a, I want to say recent ruling in, here in California, where companies that have over 50 employees need to have a retirement plan set up for those employees by June 30th, where they will start incurring severe penalties. Um, these are things that I had no idea about, but we have product specialists at the bank who just work on 401ks um, all they do and so having that kind of resource having somebody tell you hey you know you went from 40 to 60 employees you you got to get this 401k done um, that's sort of the benefit of the relationship manager and something to think about as your company grows um, equipment finance this is this is really for all stages of companies uh, seed all the way through series c we have a, a great equipment finance arm. Uh, if you are an equipment heavy business and you are buying a lot of equipment, sometimes it doesn't make sense to keep leasing, but it also doesn't make sense to buy. Uh, so this is sort of a way to uh, still make lease payments, but, uh, but you're eventually gonna own the, the product. And then structured finance is a very niche market where they, they deal in just buyouts where you're doing a merger and acquisition of a company for, for private equity firms and venture capital. So as you, you know, take your, your company to $60 million and you get approached by a competitor, that's when we'll start you know, referring you over to the structured finance team where we can get a, a secure valuation as well as potentially open more doors to uh, private equity firms and VCs to start a, a bidding war on the company. Um, City National Advantage, I mean, we have a white glove service here. We're the only bank headquartered in Los Angeles. We are dedicated to ensuring the long-term success of the Los Angeles ecosystem. That's sort of why I'm here, is to make sure that 
we have strong and successful companies that the bank can bring on as clients five, 10, 20 years down the road from now. Um, our, our bank got a new CEO recently. Her name is Kelly Coffey. She has a great story. She worked her way up from a teller at the bank, local branch, you give her your money and she deposits into your account all the way to CEO. And um, before that, we were kind of known as Bank of the Stars, where we did a lot of the movie financing, we do all the music, we do um, a lot of actors are in our private banking. And, and that's kind of was our unofficial slogan on the streets was Bank of the Stars. Well, Kelly has really switched that into Bank of Los Angeles and Bank of Entrepreneurs. You know, that's going to be the long term success of, of this market. And so, Part of that is doing this outreach to you guys and letting you know that City National is trying hard to uh, shift that uh, brand reputation into more of a uh, entrepreneurial bank for people that are founders and, and startup owners here in this community. Um, we have an extremely well-trained staff here at uh, City National. All of our colleagues are credit certified and trained. This is a year process to go through <clears throat> and everyone at the bank has to go through this process here specifically at city national where we have uh, one of my colleagues kevin kwan he is a relationship manager in uh pbb and before that he was a branch manager at chase he ran an entire branch in san francisco and he didn't know how to read a income statement a cash flow statement or a or a balance sheet yet he was running an entire branch. And so when he came here, you know, you, he was in the same classes that the interns and the analysts were in because everyone needs to have those abilities. At least that's our motto here at the bank. And so you will find that these boutique banks, specifically City National and other boutique banks have a higher level of knowledge than the, the bigger banks who are, are more just hiring people to, to cover a turnover. And lastly, I want to go over a couple success stories that I had um, that can maybe talk about a life cycle of a client and their journey with City National. Um, one of my longest ten. I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt your flow, but uh, yeah. we've got uh, six minutes left in the, uh, the session, and so we don't have anything okay. in the in the Q and A. Uh, but I did want to give uh, folks a couple of moments uh, to ask any questions if they had any. We can probably pause for a couple of moments uh, and then we can get back to the uh, success there. Yeah, no problem. Any questions, guys? And if there's none right now, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I'll put my LinkedIn um, in the chat as well as my email. And uh, happy to reach out and have a conversation with you guys. No strings attached. I'm here to make sure that nobody made the mistake that I did by, by giving up giving up on their business too early and not exploring all the avenues that a bank can offer. So we've got nothing coming in so far. So let's just go ahead and I'm sorry okay. for interrupting. Oh, don't worry about it, Matthew. Uh, yeah. So one of my longest tenured clients, uh, PMW Coffee Co. They're an instant coffee maker and distributor. They were actually referred to me by their CPA who was working with City National for a long time. Um, they came over to CMB looking to expand their, their business. At the time, they were a mom and pop company with revenues of less than $500,000. Uh, you know, they had no idea about ACH payments or, or anything like that or, or how to even use a treasury management platform. They really thought that they needed to own property in order to get money from a bank. So we set up a meetings with the owners and the CPA, and we talked about the short-term and long-term goals and what it meant to be a client here at City National. And after understanding kind of their business model and how they made revenue, we talked about these sort of larger invoices that they were starting to get. And the terms were not very favorable, kind of those Walmart, Amazons that we were talking about. And there was a potential to, you know, crash the business by accepting these, <laughs> these uh, um, uh, contracts and invoices. So we decided that the company was not lendable at the time. 
because they were losing revenue, they were not profitable, and the owners weren't even taking salary at the time. But we did create a game plan with the CPA to uh, get them to be uh, uh, bankable with City National. We let them know that we thought it was in their best interest to turn down some of these short-term contracts, and they did that. And after 18 months, they were able to establish a line of credit for $150,000 which allowed them to then execute on these uh, invoices as they were, as they were uh, put in place. So that kind of talks about that purchase order financing or those inventory financing and the revolver where people can draw on the credit as they need it to supplement the, the business as they grow. And lastly, it's D&D Technologies. They're a startup logistic company. Uh, they came to CNB looking for a business loan to hire an in-house sales team and an office manager. Um, D&D provided their financial projections and they offered their software as collateral for the loan. Um, we were unable to provide the financing for that as we wanted, you know, two years of financial statements showing profitability and we can't lend against projections. However, we provided advice and guidance on their lending and banking needs. Um, but they decided to uh, remain with their uh, existing bank because we weren't off, uh, uh, going to offer them that financing. They had treasury management services set up within a, a different bank. Um, fast forward six months, D&D gave us another call requesting a meeting. Um, they hired a new CPA and that CPA provided the exact same advice that we did and it was advice that they were not getting from the bank that they currently had. And that sort of secured to them that the bank that they had was, was not um, giving them the, great, the best advice. And even though our advice was that we can't do it, that was the right advice at the time. They agreed with us and they eventually made their, their switch over. We were able to refinance all the debt that they had taken out at the incumbent uh, bank at a much lower interest rate and it allowed the, the company to grow on and, and become more profitable. So those are kind of two different stories where maybe the company wasn't the right fit at the initial conversation, but because we had a plan in place, we already were familiar with that company. It made the hurdles a lot easier to get over the second time and the third time they came back to the bank because there was already a relationship there and we knew what markers had to be hit. For, for the loans to go out or whatever credit action they, they um, decided. So um, that is all I have. Um, I know there weren't any questions a couple minutes ago, but maybe those excellent success stories inspired a few. If there are questions or, or not, uh, Austin, you've made yourself available for uh, contact via email. And uh, I, th I think that you put your uh, LinkedIn up there yeah. as well. I just want to thank you again for uh, spending this hour with us, uh, giving this a rundown on uh, what to expect in terms of treasury management uh, for uh, for uh, new startups. So thank no you problem. That. Yeah, and in the remaining minute, I'll just we can just pause and, and uh, take some time for, for questions. But if it doesn't appear that there are any, I want to thank everybody else who's joined uh, our uh, our webinar and made it a success this past spring. Uh, please be sure to visit us at uh, UCLA Startup and Box website. Uh, for access to resources like this one and uh, law and accounting um, and, uh, and banking. So thank you, Austin. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Else. Appreciate it. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, sure.